want to welcome you to worshiping with us this morning. We are at the third part of a series that we're doing. And um, I've been telling you as we've been going through this series that we've been kind of doing it kind of conference style. Because I want you to learn. I want you to receive what God is saying. So I want to invite you to come out on Wednesdays. Because on Wednesdays we get a chance to interact and kind of talk through some things to what God is doing and what God is saying in our midst. So today um, we're going to make a little bit of a shift. Because uh, I want to get to a parable that I want to talk uh, to you a little bit this morning, and I, I don't need you to think of any other person as we're preaching or teaching this morning. I need you to think of yourself. So um, repeat after me. Say, self, today's about me. Yeah, yeah. So look, if you're sitting next to your spouse, husband or wife, tell them you're off the hook today. It's not about you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get it straight, yeah. It's about, <laughs> it's about each and every one of us individually. Um, I, want, I want to challenge you this morning. Um, and let me tell you why I want to challenge you as your pastor is because God is challenging me. And um, if God is challenging me, um, he's challenging our eldership and he's challenging all of us to go to the next place with God. So um, grab your Bibles and go with me to uh, the book of Luke chapter 16. Yeah, and we're going to be um, talking there. From Luke chapter 16, I want to um, just walk through that so that God could move and have his way. We've been in this series on breakout, and um, I'm thinking there's one more after this, but we don't know. You know, we let God be God and speak and allow God to be mit, uh, God in our midst. Now, um, we've been talking about, before I read that text, we've been talking about moments, I mean, mission, movements, and I'm sorry, moments. Movements and mission, exactly. We've been talking about that, that there are those moments when God's going to speak to you. And we need to learn how to seize the moments to turn those into movements so we can be on mission with God. So here's what I want to begin as we make the transition. And you're going to understand and appreciate a few weeks ago when we talked about the importance of rain. It's going to make sense a little bit today, but it's going to make more sense next week. Um, repeat after me again. Say self. Yeah. Seize the moment. To produce fruit. Yeah, seize the moment to produce fruit. Challenge questions. Challenge question. Uh, if God were to give you one more year, when he comes back at the end of that year, what would he find? Don't answer. You got a year. <laughs> if he comes back at the end of the year, what would he find? That's the beginning because I'm going to say to you, we are in a moment. And I think God is doing some phenomenal things in this moment. So it's up to us individually and collectively as a church body to seize that moment, turn it into a movement so we can be on mission with God. So when he comes back a year from now, um, I'm hoping he doesn't see the same thing. Yeah. There's grave consequences if he sees the same thing. So we're going to walk through a few things in scriptures this morning that I want you to look at. Now, before I even read the text, let me give you a little bit of background information. From Contextually, the passage that we're going to look at, it's about the Israelites being the people of God. And if you know anything about the Israelites, God had called them and he would selected them for a unique purpose of being the vehicle through which he was going to give birth to his child in the earth realm. He called them and he, he I mean, he took care of them just like he's taking care of us today. He provided the very best for them. And in return for his protection and his caring from them, all he asked was that they bear fruit. That's all he asked. But it seems like these knuckleheaded people just like you and I today um, had a difficult time locking into God. There was all this disobedience going on, this all this defiant, all this kind of stuff going on. And what it would look like in the Old Testament, if you were to back way up to the Old Testament, it was no different. He called them. And he would say, commit to me, serve me, I'm going to take you to a land of promise, a land flowing with milk and honey. But on the journey, the Israelites would continually disobey God. So here's what God would do at, by way of punishing them for disobeying him, is he would submit them to, the, I call them the ites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, y'all know those guys. He would submit them to them for a good butt whipping. 
Yeah, I mean, because they wouldn't obey God, so he would submit them to them. But even in the midst of that, he would still come and he would love them and he would care for them. And he would take them on his own and bring them under his wings to kind of take them to the next place so they can be all that they would have him to be. So he gives this parable today to remind the nation of Israel of what they were called to do and how they need to commit to him to walk with him on this journey to bear much fruit. Now, what you're going to see as we look at this parable that's in front of us, this fig tree that we're going to study for the next two weeks is really symbolic of the Israelites making it to the land of promise. If you were to study Old Testament, when the prophets spoke, they would use the metaphor of a fig tree to symbolize the fact that they had made it to the land of Canaan, they made it to the place of rest, and they were enjoying the blessedness that God has in store for them. Now, I'm saying that to say this before I even read the, the passage. For a lot of us, we have been on the journey a very, very long time, and we haven't gotten there yet. Can I get at least one amen? Because I know all y'all ain't got it there yet. Because Does that make sense? And, and we've been wrestling with it for a long time. And, and, and here's what I'm finding out. It's not that God is not able. The issue is not God. It's us. Yeah, God, God is faithful to his word. He really is faithful to his word. But I'm learning more and more that we don't trust God like that. We don't believe in him like that, even though we say we do. But today I want to begin a cautionary message by saying um, God is giving us a little more time to get it together. And if you know anything about the grace of God, I am not one to want to wander in the wilderness 40 more years. I want to get there. Do anybody want to just get there? Come on, y'all. Come, come on, y'all. Anybody want to get there? I mean, even if it's in your personal life. Let me go here. Maybe in your marriage, maybe on a job, maybe in your business ventures, maybe in your walk, in your relationship with God. For me, personally, it's about this vision that God has given us. And it's taken quite some time, and we're understanding seasons, and we're understanding times, and we're understanding all that stuff once again. But I'm standing before you, if you've been tracking with me with the series, that we are in a moment. <laughs> I want you to hear me say that. And, and when you're in the moment, you have to seize the moments to produce fruit so you can get propelled to destiny. And if we keep missing God on the continuum, we'll find ourselves going around this circle over and over and over and over again. So as we stand, if I can use metaphors, as we stand on the gates of Canaan, I want to challenge you this morning. Let's go in. Oh, I just need one more amen, y'all. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, you guys are tired this morning, aren't you? Come on, just say amen one more time. Say, let's go in. Now, let, let me go here for you business people. If it's been a business venture, get that thing going. <laughs> Let me give it to you, those with a call, those with ministry aspiration, those with you with educational aspirations and all that stuff, get it going. And, and you've been praying a long time. And God is saying to you, I'm saying this prophetically, I have heard your prayers and I have come down to set you free. So the issue is not God anymore, it's us. I wish I had, yeah. It's... Yeah, it's, it's us, it's us, it's us, it's us, it's, it's us. It's our tenacity, it's our aggression, it's our hunger, it's our drive to do the things that God would call us to do. And we have um, developed this passivity as it relates to our walk with God, and God is calling for a different level of energy for us to get with him. So go with me to um, Luke. Let me read this passage, and then we're going to talk through it. And I just want us to hear what God is saying. So look at verse 6 of Luke chapter 13. I'm going to read this, and then um, we're going to walk through this carefully. No, chapter 13, verse 6. Did I mess that up again? See, I told you all it ain't God, it's me. <laughs> yeah, 13, 6. 13, 6. And I am reading from the ESV. If you have an NIV or otherwise, it, um, it, it tracks pretty close. Um, but I just need to share a few principles with you. Um, that I want you to take away. If you're there, let me help belt out a big amen. amen. Okay, good. That's the kind of amen I want to hear. Now look at this. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. 
And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? Lord have mercy. And he answered him, sir, let it alone this year also. I will dig around it, and I will put manure. Uh, see, that's our problem. We don't want the manure. <laughs> yeah, we're going we gonna to we gonna work it out. Yeah, we, we, we don't want the manure. Yeah, we don't. We don't like to stink. Yeah. That's how we carry our stuff. Yeah. Then verse 9 says, and if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can do what? Yeah, look at verse 9. If it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, he says, you can do what? Now, here's what I want to say to you exegetically, and that is because this fig tree was unproductive and scheduled for demolition, the vine dresser intervened and got this tree one more year to produce fruit. That's the exegetical thing. Now, look, look at the um, big idea on the screen. I want you all to notice this. Now, track with me carefully. God's grace caused Christ to intervene on our behalf, allowing us more time to produce fruit before he pronounces judgment on us. Wow. Isn't that something? So here's what I want to get y'all this morning. Seize the moment to do what? Yeah, seize the moment to bear fruit. Okay. Now, I'm going to move quick. Here's um, the first thing I want you to get that in your spirit. And I'm going to say some harsh things this morning, but hear it to the grace of God. Okay. Barren Christianity, number one, is the predominant reason that God will sever his relationship with us. Let me put myself inclusive in that. Now, some of you are probably sitting here saying, what in the world, what kind of God is that um, that would do that? But I'm going to say this up front, and then I'll say it over and over in the text. If there is no production of fruit, then the question of are we connected to the divine comes into perspective. Are you with me? So let me get ahead of myself way, way, way back. In case you're not producing fruit, it begins with putting a seed in the ground and waiting for the rain to come so you can start. Y'all going to get this in a little while to kind of make some stuff happen, okay? But barren Christianity, barren Christianity, number one, is the predominant reason that God will sever his relationship with us. In other words, if we're not doing nothing for him, don't look for him to continually do for us. Come on, say amen if you're here this morning, okay? Because I think if we have a relationship with God, there ought to be something different, okay? This fig tree in the text that we're going to look at, it was bearing no fruit, and it caused the owner, because of the unproductivity of the fruit, it caused the owner to schedule the fruit, the fruit, the fig tree, for demolition. And I'm going to say this to you. The uh, owner had every prerogative that he wanted to to demolish this tree because it was his. He planted it where he planted it, and it was up to the fig tree to produce the fruit that the owner wanted. Now, here's the thing that I want you all to see as we kind of walk through this. As we talk through this, notice number one is that this fig tree, it really had no excuse, no excuse for producing fruit because it was positioned for production. I like that. Positioned for production. Are you guys tracking with me? Now point to yourself. Say, self, I too am positioned for production. Yeah, come on, say it again. Say, self, I too am positioned for production. Now look at the text. Look at the text. Look at verse 6 real quick. And I want to talk to this. And he told them this parable. He said, a man had a fig tree. And what's striking about this particular fig tree, it was planted where? Oh, come on. Come on. It was planted where? Now, now here's the thing you need to know about fig, fig tree. Historically and culturally, fig trees bore crops twice a year. There was this May, June, and then there was August, September production where the tree would literally start budding and producing fruit. Now, the thing that's striking about this fig tree is this was not a fig tree that was located by the roadside like some other trees that we may see in Scripture that ended up being barren. 
okay? This tree was positioned in a strategic place by the owner, and by virtue of the fact of where the tree was positioned, production was expected. My Bible, and I'm thinking your Bible says the same tree thing, that this was not a wild tree. This was not a tree that was out there on its own. It said that the tree was positioned in a vineyard. Okay, now if you know anything about vineyards, or if you have ever seen a vineyard any day in your life, vineyards are well kept for. Oh, I need two witnesses in here. Matter of fact, matter of fact, matter of fact, those of you, I wish I knew some names of some wines, but I don't want, you know, I'm going to leave it alone. Um, <laughs> but, but if you've seen a vineyard, I mean, it is neatly kept in nice rows, and the, the vines are kept off the ground on these beautiful things. I mean, matter of fact, I don't know that we can ever say we've walked through a vineyard and we've seen weeds or leaves all over the vineyard because the vine dresser takes meticulous care to go through the vineyard on an everyday basis and make sure that the vineyard is taken care of. Now, by virtue of the fact that this tree was positioned in a vineyard leads me to believe that the vine dresser did not overlook this tree. I want you all to get this because somebody in here needs to know that you too are planted where? In God's yeah, come on, come on, come on, come on. And we're going to go to this text in a little while, but you hear Jesus saying metaphorically, I'm the vine and you are the branches. What do you think he's talking about? You're not wild people hanging out on the sides of the road that doesn't have a vine dresser looking after you day in and day out. Come on, you are positioned for production. By virtue of the fact that we're in the kingdom of God, God the vine dresser takes care of us. You want to know why you woke up this morning? It's because the vine dresser came by and he picked you up. Come on. You want to know why weeds aren't growing in your yard? It's because the vine dresser, he goes by and he meticulously plucks the weeds and he takes care of you. You want to know why dragging on the ground? It's because the vine dresser, he picks you up and he places you on the post that he has in his vineyard. The vine dresser cares. We are positioned. Woo. Come on, turn to your quick and say, neighbor, I am positioned. For production. Now here's what you need to know about this tree. This was no new tree. The text doesn't say that the tree was just planted yesterday. Are you with me? It, it doesn't say that this was a new tree that just came on the scene and then all of a sudden the owner puts the mandate or the obligation on the tree to produce fruit. The grammar in the text leads us to believe it was in the imperfect tense that says it was ongoing action. That means that this was an old tree, listen to this, that used to produce at some point in time. And then, and then it got lazy. Well, no, let me say it differently. It got used to the vine dresser taking care of it. And then it stopped. Yeah, y'all guys are walking with me. Because when I first came to God, man, you didn't have to tell me to produce fruit. I had, like Grandma Dame used to say, said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I just couldn't do what? But the longer I got stayed in the vineyard, I kept it. Come on now. <laughs> and don't act like it's not you because some of us in here, when we first came to Christ, there was an excitement about the relationship we had with him. There was an excitement. There was a jubilation because yesterday I did drugs, but today I stopped. Come on. Yesterday I was sick, but today he brought me out. There was an excitement about the freshness and the newness, but the longer I stayed in relationship, that imperfect verb now applies to me. I stopped bearing fruit. Wow. Go ahead and say me too. Yeah, go ahead and say, come on, y'all. Let me just ask this by way of challenge again. When was the last time you led a person to Christ? It was number one, position for production. You guys are tracking with me? Look at the second thing real quick, okay? Um, if I can get this to, to move, I want to make sure it goes. Now watch this. In spite of the fig tree being positioned for production, it became complacent and it perpetuated its performance. I'll explain. 
Go back to the text. Look at verse 6b. Let me read verse 6. He told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it, and he found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I have found what? None. And notice what he says. Cut it down. And then why should it do what? Use up the what? We're going to talk about that in a little while. Okay? It perpetuated its performance. Let me tell you what this means. Three years could be a metaphor to, or some sort of idiomatic way of saying that it's been a long time now since I've been checking this thing for fruit and I'm not seeing any. So something has happened where this tree has fooled itself into thinking it's all about the vine dresser making it feel good. It's all about the vine dresser picking up the vines. It's all about the vine dresser plucking the weed. And somehow the tree, listen to how I'm going to say it, has fooled itself into believing that it's in the vineyard, the best possible location, and it's reaping the water, the benefits, all that stuff that I'm giving to the vine, but it has fooled itself into thinking it doesn't have to give me anything in return. And the nerve of this tree, I was cool year one. I was even cool year two. Matter of fact, I'm at the end of year three. And that joke is still. If I let it go year four, five, six, seven, eight, it's going to continue to perpetuate its performance and not do its intended design because the tree now is going to fool itself into thinking it's a grape. <laughs> and I don't need to do figs anymore. The reason a lot of us can't answer the question on when was the last time we led someone to Christ, and I'm just using that. There's a lot of applications here that we can connect to this, and we're going to go here in a little while. Is because we continue to perpetuate our performance and we keep fooling ourselves into thinking it's all right to be on the battlefield and not fight. And, and, and the reason we have stopped fighting and the reason we've stopped producing and the reason we've stopped bearing fruit and we've stopped seizing the moments is because God every day, like I said, keeps holding up the banner. He keeps protecting. He keeps providing. He keeps doing what God is supposed to do. He keeps doing what only God can do. And you and I now uh, have gotten so complacent that our behaviors are the same. Matter of fact, we've gotten so comfortable in this Christian journey that we get up in the morning and go to work and be because we, even when we forget to pray, to pray, it doesn't even mean nothing to us. It doesn't even phase us no more. Come on, come on, don't act like it's just me. We get up in the morning and we eat like the food is supposed to be there and we don't even thank God for it. I wish I had somebody in here. Come on. We, we do the things that we do on a regular basis and we barely stop to say, God, I thank you. Matter of fact, some of us don't even know what prayer is. If you don't believe me, look at Wednesday night when we talk about coming to prayer. It don't mean nothing because a lot of us have it's, come, it's become a place where it's not important anymore because we are perpetuating the performance. We, be, we keep doing these bad things and these sick things and act as if God is not phased by it. We are hurting the owner. I need y'all to hear me. I need because we're in a moment. We're in a moment. We're in a moment. We're in a moment, we're in a moment, and we have to do something different so we can get to fruit. Are you with me? Let me tell you how much we perpetuated the performance. This thing has gotten so bad that marijuana laws are being passed right under our nose, and we're not doing anything or not about it. Gay marriages are happening right in our backyard, and we're not doing nothing about it. Matter of fact, it's even too late to do anything because we should have been in position to stop these things from happening, and the world is going to hell in a handbasket while the church is having good church, and it's not about having good church. It's about bearing, I wish I had somebody in here. It's about bearing fruit for the master. But we are so complacent, perpetuating the performance. 
that it doesn't mean nothing no more. So what I don't pray? So what I got up? So what I don't thank God? Let me go here. So what I don't even worship him? Perpetuating the performance. Are you guys tracking with me? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, he talking about me now. Yeah, yeah. Come on, tell all the neighbors. Tell the neighbor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at this. Position for production, perpetuating its performance. Watch this. In perpetuating the performance, the fig tree absorbed the nutrients from the what? Yeah, that's sad. Let me tell you what's going on. Here's the deal. That word absorbed or used up means to make no effect. It's occupying nutrients that could have been devoted to things that really belong in the vineyard. Oh, you got to hear how I just said that. You have to. <laughs> Let me say it this way. Y'all get this. Taking God's attention from the things that he really should be looking at and forcing it on us who aren't doing nothing in the first place. Here was this tree in a vineyard and, 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 and the nutrients, and you have to understand the size of a fig tree and how big it can get and how big it can grow compared to the size of a grapevine. So if you have this huge tree planted in the same place where a grapevine is, here's what's going to happen. The nutrients that's designed for the grapevine will naturally be sucked up by the roots of the tree because it's the bigger. Are you tracking with me? So if, 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 if it's sapping nutrients from the tree and then it's not producing what the master expects it to produce, here's what he says. Why should this thing continue to use up the soil as difficult and as convicting as this may seem here is my prayer Lord I hope that's not what you're saying about me I hope Lord that's not what you're saying about me let me go bigger I hope God that's not what you're saying about this ministry. Let's go bigger. Are you with me? I, I hope, God, that's not what you're saying about the vision that you've given us. Let me speak prophetically for a little while. Three years I keep looking for fruit, metaphorically, for a span of time. Ministry 17 years old, and we're not there yet. And I ask the question, what's the holdup? It's not God. Because God can snap his finger. Y'all don't believe me? Go read Genesis. Let there be. Yeah. yeah. And here's how I said it a couple of weeks ago. When God releases the word, Isaiah chapter 55, my word cannot return to me void unless it accomplishes that which I sent it to you. So if the word is stuck in the earth realm. I wonder... What's holding the word down? It's not God. He released it. And his expectation is that it goes out and does what he sends it to do. And then it comes back and says, they rolling. They're not using up the soil. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Y'all just give me a, mm, let me know y'all hearing something. <laughs> You see, so here's what he says. If, if it's going to continually use up the soil, here's what he says. He says, cut it down, okay? So here, here's what that says to me by way of application. I want you all to hear me say this. Is what good is the spiritual gift that's deposited in the person if the person isn't using the gift that he gave them? What was the point? Let me, let me make it more real. Let me start with me. What good is a pastoral gifting if you're not shepherding what good is a teaching gifting if you're not teaching? Come on. What good is an eldering gifting if you're not 
elder rain. Come on, talk to me. I want y'all to hear me this morning. What good is a, come on, need I go on? Need, need I go on? Because when I look at myself, I see giftings that spread throughout the place, and I'm wondering, why is it that God has given us these things, and we're sitting on the thing, sucking up nutrients that could be going to somewhere else to allow God to do what God done, and I think the Lord is getting to the place where he's saying, if it's not going to produce... Ah, oh, Jesus, Lord, Lord, help me. I want y'all to hear me. Come on, is this making sense? Come on, come on, come on. Here's the thing we need to understand. At, at some point in time in our Christian journey, we need to understand that God designed us to be more of a blessing than a burden. I, I need two people just to say amen. Are you with me? At some point, he anticipates that we become more of a blessing than a what? Burden. Now, let me give you this thing literally and contextually in Scripture. The whole point of the parable was this issue with, they were talking about the Galileans doing certain things, but the Israelites weren't aligning up. And here's the thing. He chose them. He set them apart so they can be a blessing to the entire world, but instead, they were more of a burden to him. So they ended up, come on, detracting his attention from reaching the world because of their own foolishness. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a hindrance to God's blessing and doing what he wants done in the earth realm. I want to be a blessing, not a burden. Come on, anybody else in here want to be a blessing this morning? Come on, say amen if you believe that. Let me, let me show you one thing real quick. Go to John chapter 15. Go to John chapter 15. I'm almost there. I want you all to walk this out with me. John chapter 15. And, and, and I, want you, I want you to see something, and, and then we're going to let it do what it wants to do. You interpret this however you want to interpret it, and then um, theologically, we're going to wrestle with this on Wednesday night. John chapter 15, I want to show you something that's been there. Say amen if you're there. Look at what it says in verse 1. Notice what he says. I am the true vine, and who's the vine dresser? And then watch verse 2. Every branch in me that does not do what? He does what? Now, the, 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 the NIV says, anybody have an NIV? Real quick. Yell that out. What does it say? NIV says what? He does what? Yeah, come on, say it. Say it. Say it out loud. He cuts off every branch. Now, this is the scary part of this verse. Look at, look at verse 1. I am the vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Now, look at verse 2 carefully. This is what scares me about this verse. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he cuts or he takes away. Okay? Now, let me, let me, let me I'm not going to go deep theologically in this, but the implication in the text is I can be in Christ and not bear fruit, and because I'm in Christ and not bearing fruit, I shouldn't look for a reward because I might not even make it in. The text seemed to be saying that. Are you with me? We'll, we'll deal with that theologically on Wednesday, but I want you all to hear me. So, so, so don't, don't fool yourself into thinking because I'm wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in Jesus and the world can't do me no harm means that you're going to make it in. Because the text says, even though the world might not be able to do you harm, if you're sucking up the nutrients from the soil because you've been positioned for production, come on, but you've been perpetuating a performance and absorbing the nutrients from the soil, he's going to look at you and say, yeah, I had you, but all along it's been a waste of my time, so I'm going to cut you off. And here's what I'm going to say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and not feed you? When did we see naked and not clothed? He says, in as much as you've done it for the least of these, he says. My gosh, this is some scary stuff. That's some scary stuff. Are y'all hearing me this morning? Be cautious. This is free. Of being in Christ and still unproductive. Lord Jesus, that's some scary. You mean I just don't have all I need to get saved and make it in? Well, here's how James puts it if you're saved, unproductivity is an impossibility. Here's how he says it Show me your faith by your works. You say you have faith and I have deeds. 
Let me show you my faith by what I do. If there's no doing associated with your Christianity, the big scissors is coming out. <laughs> Y'all all right? Grab your neighbor real quick. Say, neighbor. Ouch. Come on, grab him real quick. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, now here, here, here's the shout, and then we're going to talk about this. This is, this is what I want you to take away. The intervention, the intervention of the vine dresser. Yeah, that's a hallelujah right there. Yeah, yeah. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Here's how Romans 6 says it. Uh, Romans 20, uh, what's it? Romans 8 and 26. The Spirit intercedes for us with groans and uttering which cannot be said. To me, that's what Romans 8 and 26 is all about. Jesus sitting at the right hand of God saying, God, give him one more year because Pastor Felix is going to preach a message on, on the 24th of April. <laughs> God, give them one more year because they're going to hear about moments and movements and mission. And then they're going to go say, if you cut them down now, it's going to be premature because time was not yet. And for everything, there's a season and there's a time for every activity on the heaven. So God, April 24th is going to be their time. Oh, I wish you were here for the whole series. I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. I thank God for Jesus. Are you with me? Because you are like me, and don't act like you hadn't done anything wrong. We deserve to be cut down a long time ago, but for the grace of God, we are still standing here having second, third, fourth, fifth, seven chances to produce. It's time to get on the battlefield with the Lord. I need somebody to hear me this morning. Come on. It's not you that preserve yourself from the calamity. It was Jesus making intercession. Come on. It wasn't you that brought yourself out of the stuff that had you all along. It was Jesus making intercession because all we were doing was sucking up nutrients from the soil. I don't act like you've been saved and been acting right all your little life. I don't know about you, but that's not my testimony. Come on. I was one of them, what you call them, fish that just be sucking. Oh, come on now. If I can grab a hole, I'd do it because I did not understand the importance of bearing fruit. And when I didn't understand that, it was the grace of God that was keeping me. It was the grace of God that was preserving me. It was the grace of God giving me that 20th chance. And if you're here and you're a recipient of that grace, you ought to be saying amen. amen. Come on, I think, and if I'm correct, I think that's all of us in here. Turn to everyone and say, neighbor, he's talking about you now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he, yeah. Come on, say, now nah, he's talking about you. Because we all, come on, come on, every last one of us in here have done some foolish stuff that deserve to be cut off a long time ago. But the grace of God, I wish I had somebody in here that God brought out of something, that God healed from something, that God turned around, come on, that he put your foot on solid ground, that God gave you a new tough start. I wish I had somebody in here that know what God has done for you. The grace of God. The grace of God. And excuse the phrase, this is not meant to offend anybody. And we become so dug on arrogant that we fool ourselves into thinking it's all about us and we did it ourselves and we don't even take a moment to thank him. Sucking up nutrients from the soil. I thank God. I thank God. I thank God. Watch that. Here's what the vine dresser promised to do. To cultivate and to fertilize the soil around the fig tree. Now let me switch subjects here. By way of application, when the master showed up and he looked at the tree, even though he had a problem with the tree. <sighs> the vine dresser took the hit for the tree. And here's what the vine dresser says. He says, Master, please, please give me 
one more year to seize the moment to produce fruit. Now let me tell you why that bothers me so much. It's because when God comes down to look at this house, he doesn't blame the fig tree. <laughs> Blames the vine. Yeah. Yeah. That's why that bugs me so much because I don't like that text. Because <laughs> he's looking at me. And I'm the one that has to say to him, Lord, give me one more year. Give me, give me, yeah, give me, yeah, give me, give me one more year. That's, that's hard on a brother, amen? Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but the, the, th the reason, the reason, the reason it's hard on me and, and the reason I can carry the load because I don't live where you live. I don't work where you work. I don't have your spiritual gift. And so when he go past me and he goes into your vineyard and he looks at your grapes and you're the fig tree, then he looks at you as the vine dresser. But I wish I had somebody. <laughs> So, so, so when it comes to personal application now, he goes past me and he goes to you and he says, what vineyard are you in charge of that you have not taken care of? So let me tell you what it's looked like. Let me pastor, let me hit the elders, right? So if you're an eldership and you have a vineyard that's not producing fruit, quit framing the fig tree. Y'all done got quiet. Right? And the problem with the church is we are good at blaming the fig tree, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 because the vine is, I mean, the, the master got a salute. He just like cut it down. I can do what I got to do, zap, zap. That's God, right? But it's up to the vine dressers to intervene and intercede and say, Lord, give me one more year, right? So, so be it a business idea, be it a ministry, be it whatever fruit is supposed to be, we can't keep blaming the tree. Here's a personal application. If the marriage is jacked up, you can't keep blaming the spouse. Oh, I'm going to get quiet now. What you talking about, preacher? She the one that always be. Well, <laughs> you guys are walking with me? Give me one more year to cultivate and fertilize the soil around the fig tree. Are you guys seeing what I'm seeing in that text? Come on, say one more year. He said, give me one more year, okay, to, to kind of take care of it and to cultivate it and to do what needs to be. So here's what God wants from us, and I'm going to talk about this a lot next week. His anticipation is that we produce fruit. Say, it's all about producing fruit. Say it again. Say, it's all about producing fruit. Now, I need to say this as, as politely and as lovingly as I can, um, so, so as not to offend anyone, then I need to go to the, to the last part of this and land this plane. We must know what fruit is. And we're going to talk about fruit extensively next week. The problem with the church is that once we come in, is we fool ourselves into thinking it's all about being in. And we forget about the places where God has brought us from and what we used to do while we were there. Are you with me? Here's why I love God so much and why I love Jesus so much. is because, here's, notice the verbs I'm going to use. He left his home in glory and he came down to the earth realm where I was. Okay, and when I look at the pattern of his life, even Christ in the New Testament church and Paul in, in the, the epistles, is that yes, they went to church and they had good worship. But what I found out about New Testament theology and my theology of church in the New Testament, I don't know that I read very many places where they had a good men's day program. I don't know that I read many places where they had a good annual usher's day and a good pastor's anniversary program or a great choir musical. I don't know that I read 
many places. Come on, y'all not hearing me this morning because our framework of church is all internal and not external. And our theology is so skewed and so crazy, we expect the lost to come in here so they can be saved because we become so complacent in our production that we refuse to go where they are. Come on, come on, talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. And, and our theology has become an internal one of a relationship with God, and we wonder why the church isn't growing, why the church can't get to vision, why the church can't get to where we need to be. Listen, God brought us out so we can go back in. Are you hearing me? Producing fruit is not only what we do. When we come on Sunday, we ought to go butt crazy and butt wild and just get all loose for our worship for God. We ought to be so pumped up and so fired up in here because we are the fellowship of the, the church and the saints. But when we leave this place on Monday and we go out into the world on Monday, we ought to go to our job and tell somebody about a Savior who came to seek and to save that was lost. On Tuesday, we ought to be out there feeding the hungry. Come on. On Wednesday, we ought to be clothing the naked on Thursday. We ought to be visiting the sick in the hospital. Come on. On Friday, we ought to be going to the prison on Saturday. We need to tell the drug addict that they can get an overdose of the Holy Ghost such that when we come to church on Sunday, we've got a reason to celebrate because we've been producing fruit all week long. But this is what we do. We come to the vineyard and we look for production in here. He promised to cultivate, cultivate and fertilize the soil and dig around it. This is free. The reason we don't like manure is because going to where we came from still stinks. And we don't want the folk that knew us when <laughs> to remind us of what we used to do. So here's what we do. We become complacent, and we get saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, sealed with fire, speaking in tongues, Shonda. And then we walk around dignified, nose up in the air, as if that was not us. Cultivate is easy. Fertilizing is hard. We're going to talk about that. And the reason, let me give this away, then I'm going to stop. The reason we're not ready for rain is because we have not cultivated. We have not fertilized. So we don't expect nothing to happen. We have no seed in the ground. <laughs> this will really mess you up. Let me land here. Look at the last thing really quick. And then we're going to hit this. When the year's work was over, the vine dresser left the decision regarding the life of the fig tree in the hands of the owner. That jacked me up. Let me, let me show it to you in the text. Let me, let me show you in the text. Um, let me show you in the text. Look at verse, go back to Luke 13, and then we're going to stop and pray. Is this helping you all? Okay, Luke 13, look at verse 9, and then we we'll stop with that. Okay. And this is the, the problem with English translations, and this is why I wish um, most of us understood the value and the importance of the original languages and textual criticisms and manuscripts and all that stuff. Listen to what the translation says. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, the ESV has well and good. Okay. But if not, you can cut it down, and your translations have something different. But here's what I want to say. If you were to go to the text, the, the original language, um, the then clause of the if statement, let me say it that way, because notice most um, sentences are written this, this way. If this, then that. Okay? And the then clause is known as the apodosis or the back end of the if clause. But here's what this author did. The then clause is not in the original language. It just says, if it should bear fruit next year, end conversation. In other words, it's not my business what happens next year. That's your business. 
Because of the ambiguity of what's going to happen, our translation should have added the phrase, well or good or then and all that good stuff. But that's not in the original language. In other words, what it's saying, God, you're serving. All I can do is cultivate and fertilize the decision on what happens with the tree is in your hand. Let me kind of say it in a way that you can understand. All I can do is plant and water and allow increase to belong to who? No, y'all got to say it belong to who? That's very, very important because here's the thing. This is where we play God is we try to predict and mandate increase when it's not of our, none of our business. And we get our feelings hurt when God doesn't do what we think he ought to do. Listen, you can't tell God. I wish I had somebody in here. You can't tell God what he needs to do, when he needs to do it, and how he needs to do it. All you need to do as the vine dresser is cultivate and fertilize and dig and do what he calls you to do and leave increase to God. Quit playing, God. <laughs> that jacked me up. Because if I work, I want to see results. Come on, y'all. If you work, you want to see results. And I want to tell God what results ought to look like. My Lord, today. My job is to seize the moment, turn it into a movement, be on mission with God, and let God do what God is going to do. We're going to come back and finish this story on next week. But I want you to really understand with me that God loves, God cares, God's there for us. And God's grace caused Christ to intervene on our behalf, allowing us more time to produce fruit before he pronounces judgment on us. This is when I start praying, hey, Jesus, don't come back today, okay? Because <laughs> I want to say, I can do better. So this is the one time I'm praying, hold up, Jesus. Because <laughs> if you come right now, I don't know that I'm looking too good. Is it just me or? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So, so give me one more year. 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 And, and, and my t personal testimony, all this makes so much sense to me. Um, the reason I didn't die of cancer is because God's saying, you're not done yet. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and this is going to sound so crazy to you all, um, but I want you to hear the heart and the spirit in which I'm saying it. And by virtue of the fact that I am the vine dresser right now, I mean, he can do whatever he wants to do tomorrow over this vineyard, and he brought me back. That means he's not done with you yet. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, 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 you're getting it. Yeah, yeah. Because watch this now. Collectively, we have a vision to realize. We have work to do. Metaphorically speaking, we have a year. I'm not saying literally. God is gracing us with time. He's gracing us with time. At some point, he's going to come back and say, the year is up. Yeah, you get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I'm you and I don't even know God as Lord and Savior, I'm like, yeah, Jesus now. And if I'm also you and I haven't gotten in the game, I'm like, where do I sign up? You kind of get what I'm saying? Let's begin and let's get active together. And, and when the master comes, he can see fruit. We're going to pick this up next week. Bow your heads with me. Bow your heads with me as the worship team comes. I know the word's heavy, but my prayer is that by the end of this series, we all would have seeds in the ground. And when we come to worship, we're saying, God, send the rain. We're saying send the rain because we're ready for production. Holy Spirit, God, you're welcome in this place. Thank you for this word. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for how you're moving in our midst. Thank you for what you're teaching us. I know this word was very convicting and very hard. But there comes a point in time where, as a pastor, you have to stand and speak prophetically to the group of people you lead to get us to where we need to go. We have to go into Canaan. 
We have to do the things you've called us to do. We have to be about your business. So this morning, I worship you for gracing me. One more year. We worship you, God, for gracing us as a ministry. Forgive us for missing you, God. My prayer now is that person that's sitting there that knows that you've called them, that knows that you've saved them, that knows that you want to do a great thing in their life, but have not said, yes, God. Bring them to you. Then additionally, my prayer is for that one that have strayed away from the fold, God, that's saying, I have gifts and talents and abilities. Bring me to a place, God. Holy Spirit, move in this place, Lord. Thank you for being God. Thank you for what you're doing. More importantly, God, forgive us for missing you. Forgive us for not being about what you've called us to be. Oh, we can do better. Oh, we can do better. Rekindle the flame, God. Rekindle the flame. Rekindle the flame. Yes, Lord Jesus. In your name, Lord. Come on, stand to your feet this morning.